you ever walked along the ocean and wondered what lay beneath the waves? I have, and in this episode, I'm inviting my friends to come explore my own backyard, the temperate coastal oceans. But to do so, we're gonna need dive gear. How could I turn down the chance to explore the cold temperate waters with my good friend Jonas? But you know what? I wasn't the only one who wanted to take this opportunity. Well, I grew up here in Scandinavia and worked on my master's degree in marine biology, so I've learned why this environment is amazing. For instance, it's an important source of food for us. Huh? Oh my god, there's so many lobsters in Sweden. Wonderful lobster. I think I should take a better look at this lobster fishery. So, I only deal with tropical waters, but that's part of the reason I'm here. I'm here to look for a sessile animal who's really a more of a community of animals living together as one structure. I'm here to look for a type of sea pen. I specialize in marine food web interactions, and I'm here to explore this amazing predator. This beautiful creature entangles its prey, engulfs them, and changes rich protein into nearly 90% of water. Let's go. Let me tell you about the coastal oceans. The coastal zone is a section of the ocean from the high tide mark to the edge of the continental shelf. That means it covers 8% of the ocean, but it's in this zone that we harvest 90% of the global marine fish catch. In temperate oceans, this high productivity is usually a result of an upwelling from the deep. And it's in these deep waters that I will head to. But first, let me show you what it is that we're searching for. Imagine for just a second a little plant-like stalk. But it's not a plant, it's a kind of cnidarian, a species closely related to corals, and it's very unique. Many individual polyps organize themselves into one structure. One polyp forms a stalk and a muscular holdfast to keep it on the ground. The other polyps attach to the sides and filter plankton from the water. Find my seedlings with a lead. Get out of these warm waters and go down deeper where the water is cold and dark. Come on, let's go! Where I am now, the water is about 65 degrees Fahrenheit, but below the thermocline, in the depths, the water is only 8 degrees above freezing. I'm on the search for a big old clawed crustacean, the European lobster. I search around the rocky bottom, although at this time of the year, I'm probably better off following the bait. The ocean floor is covered in cages to catch this valuable gem from the ocean. Still, no lobsters to be seen, even in the cages. This one's only filled with crabs. I better ascend and change my approach and try to observe these animals from above. You had a chance to talk to the people that really knows this lobster fishery, the fishermen. Fishermen fish these waters heavily for a few months until catches drop. There's a big incentive to fish them too. A lobster can pull in 50 US dollars a pound. But lobster fishing isn't one take all, there are rules. They must have at least 8 centimeters carapace length. Females with eggs have to stay, and certain areas of the coast are off limits for fishing. This cage we put right on the edge of a, of a reserve zone. 
and obviously four lobsters. That's the best one so far. So it seems there are good rules to keep this fishery sustainable. Oh. All right, I'm gonna get back in my dive gear. I'm done here. We're gonna check out what Stephanie's doing. Down here, I'm searching for the jellyfish. Not all jelly-like creatures are true jellyfish. This, for example, is an unrelated cone jelly, a tinaform. But let me tell you more about why jellyfish are interesting to me. Let's look at a traditional marine food web. We start with unicellular photosynthesizing plankton. These are eaten by other plankton, which are then eaten by smaller fish, which are then eaten by bigger fish. Energy is accumulated with each trophic step in the form of carbon and protein. But then you have the jellyfish, who eat plankton, small fish, big fish and other jellies. And then turn that carbon into a jelly-like mass that's constituted of 95% of water. So it's these ancient creatures whose brain are little more than a tangle of neurological cells that I'm looking for. More particularly, I'm scanning for the largest jellyfish in the world, the line mane jellyfish. In the Arctic, they can get up to 6 feet in diameter, with tentacles 30 feet long. They are truly unusual beauties. Now where is Rob? I thought he was with you! Oh. Deep down here in this fjord, at 110 feet, I've finally found the sea pins. This one here is the phosphorescent sea pin. But there are others too, like the far more rare, tall sea pins. Look closely and you can see each individual polyp on the stalk. Truly amazing. For more information, go to www.thewildclassroom.com slash biomes. And we encourage you to never stop exploring.